In the IELTS test, you hear some recordings and you have to answer questions on them. You have time to read the instructions and questions and check your work. All recordings are played only once. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You will hear a conversation between a man and a woman discussing the loss of a bag on board a plane. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You will see that there is an example. This time only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Pan Asian Airways, John speaking. Can I help you? Yes, please. I left something on one of your planes last night. I got this number from the operator. Is this the right number to call? Yes, madam. This is the right number. I just need you to tell me your name to start with so I can fill out a lost property form. Kirsty Allen. That's K-I-R-S-T-Y-A-L-L-E-N So, Kirsty is the correct answer. Now we begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as a recording is not played twice. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Pan Asian Airways, John speaking. Can I help you? Yes, please. I left something on one of your planes last night. I got this number from the operator. Is this the right number to call? Yes, madam. This is the right number. I just need you to tell me your name to start with so I can fill out a lost property form. Kirsty Allen. That's K-I-R-S-T-Y-A-L-L-E-N. Right, I've got that. Now, what happened last night? Well, I was on a flight last night from New York to London that landed at 12.30am. We were delayed a while in New York, so that when we eventually landed, I was so tired that I accidentally left my handbag on the plane. Did you report this to anyone last night? No, I'm afraid not. I didn't notice until I got home, and then it was really too late to phone. Very well, madam. Let me take a few details for this form, and I'll see what I can do. OK. So the name is Kirsty Allen. And what's the address, please? 48 Wyndham Road, Richmond. The postcode? R16GH7. Good, I've got that. Now, your telephone number? Well, my home number is 020-8927-7651. And my mobile is 07754 Eight nine seven four three two. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the second one. What was the mobile again? O double seven five four eight nine seven four three two. Thanks. Now, do you know the flight number of the plane you were on last night? Oh yes. Hang on a second. I've got my boarding pass stub right here. Uh, the flight number was PA three five six. No, I, I'm sorry, PA365. That's it, 365. And does the boarding card stub say what seats you had? Oh yes, it was E6. And you said that it was New York to London Heathrow, is that right? Yes, that's right. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. OK then. Now, I have to take some details about the bag that you lost. It was a handbag, yes? That's right. Could you describe it to me? Well, I guess it just looks like any regular handbag. It's very dark red with black handles and the catch on the top is gold coloured. 
Does it have any distinguishing marks? Not really. It's quite new, you see, so I haven't scratched it or anything. It's got a brand name, but that's just inside the bag when you open it, under the catch. OK. Now, can you tell me what was inside the bag? Quite a few things, actually. Not my passport, of course, or I would never have got out of the airport. My purse is inside, and that's got about $200 and about £70 cash. There is also my credit card and some membership cards. Good. I'll just write that down. Anything else in the bag? A small paperback that I was reading, some makeup, my work keys, but not my house keys, thank God, and a couple of pens. Have you informed the police about the loss of the card? Yes, and I've also cancelled the card with the credit company. Right. Now what I'll do is to contact the lost property, which is where your bag will have gone if it was found. I'll give you a call back within an hour and tell you what the situation is. If you haven't had a call within an hour and a half, call back this number and ask for me. My name is John, OK? Yes, that's great, John. I'll speak to you later. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of section one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear a man giving a welcome speech to new students at the University of Westley. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully to the welcome speech and answer questions 11 to 14. Hello and good afternoon. My name is John Walker and I'd like to welcome you new students to the University of Westley. What I'm going to do today is just explain to you some of the facilities that you'll find here on our main campus and where you'll find them. If you look at the map on the overhead projector, let me talk you through some of the locations before describing some of them in more detail. Well, at present, we're in the university's main lecture hall. If you go out of the main front entrance, then you will see opposite across the car park the entrance for the focal point of a lot of university life for most students. This is, of course, the Students' Union. About 150 yards on the left of the union, as you look at it from here, is another focal point for the students, though not as popular as the union the University Library. Behind the library is the main university refectory, where many students eat both lunch and dinner. On the other side of the Union is the College Chapel, and behind that there is a small hall of residence. There are three other halls of residence behind the Students' Union. Behind the hall that we're in now is the Sports Hall and Grounds, and either side of us are academic departments with lecturers' offices, lecture halls, and various labs. You'll find it all a bit confusing at first, but you'll get to know your way around fairly quickly. You now have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the welcome speech and answer questions 15 to 20. I'd like now to talk about a few important places on the campus. All students must belong to the Students' Union if they wish to use any of its services. It's very cheap and we certainly recommend that you join. The Union provides a bookshop 
covering all the course books at the university, plus lots of other titles for a range of interests. You can eat and drink at the Union. There is a Fat Phillips on the ground floor, serving a wide range of fast foods and drinks. Then there is the main Union bar up on the first floor. This is where the Union parties, dances and balls are held. And there's a pizza corner where cheap, large pizzas can be served up in a few minutes. Other areas that will be of interest to students are the welfare office, the travel office and the club's office. The club's office will get you in touch with all the clubs that are part of the students' union. These clubs vary from football to drama to potholing to beer drinking. There really is something for everyone. The union opens up at 8am every day and closes at 12 midnight, unless there are any functions going on later. I'd like to move on to the library now. This is where a lot of you will, I hope, be spending a lot of time over the next three or four years, working and doing research. Of course, this isn't as exciting as the social aspects of university life, but of course it really is the main reason that you are all here. I therefore urge you to get over there as soon as you can, as you have to register, and then you can have a look around. During the first two weeks of the academic year, that is, now, there are tours every two hours aimed at familiarising new students to all the services that the library offers. The library is open from 9am to 9pm, though it stays open later during final exams. As I said earlier, the refectory is behind the library. The refectory offers a range of cheap meals at lunch times and in the evenings. It's open from 12 noon to 3 p.m. for lunch, and from 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. for dinner. They try to offer a variety of food, from favourites to healthy options to ethnic foods, and there's always a choice for vegetarians and vegans. The University Sports Hall is one of the most used buildings at the University. To use the hall or the grounds, you must be a member of the Athletic Union, which is part of the Students' Union. Again, this costs very little and will allow you to use all university sports facilities, represent university teams, and it fully ensures you during your membership of the Athletic Union. This is really excellent value. For departments and academic facilities, there isn't enough time to go through all of them, but your respective departments should furnish you with maps and information that will satisfy your needs. For all services offered at the University, I recommend that you purchase a Discount Plus card. This card costs £50 and lasts for the academic year. It will then give you discounts on all services at the University. For instance, a £4 meal at the refectory would be reduced to £2.50. It will also give you free usage of the late night minibus that the University runs to places off campus which normally costs a pound. You can see that it wouldn't take very long to make it worthwhile. The cards can be bought at the Students' Union. Well, that's what I have to say for the moment. Now, are there any questions? That is the end of Section 2. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear two students discussing the new term at their university. First you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hey John, I didn't know you were here at university yet. When did you get here? Oh, just yesterday, Thursday. I've got some stuff to get sorted out for the start of my second year as I've just got some new subjects. Today I've got to sort out my timetable. It seems like I've got quite a lot to do this year. When did you get here? I've been here since Tuesday. What classes are you doing this year then? Well, I'm continuing economics of course, as that's my major, but I'm taking an extra maths class and I'm dropping Spanish so I can take up French. What about you? My major's the same as yours of course, but I'm going to continue the same classes as last year as I like them so much. They're history and music. What's your Monday timetable like? Well, at nine, it looks like I've got French for three hours. That's going to be a tough start to the week. Yeah, I can't imagine it worse. I've got history for three hours, which will kill me. The good thing for me is that I've got a free in the afternoon, which will relax me after that morning. Uh, no such luck for me, though. I've got that extra maths class starting then, so I'll be hard at work all day on Mondays. Yeah, I don't envy you that. Still, the extra maths will really help your economics in the long run. I know, that's why I'm taking it this year. Last year I really struggled with all the maths that I didn't understand in the economics. But hopefully, this year, that will all change. What about sport? What have you chosen to do on Wednesday sports afternoons? Are you sticking with rowing? I'd love to, but the rowing club storeroom got broken into and the boats were damaged, so it's not possible till the club can get enough money to repair or replace the boats. They're really expensive, so that'll take quite a long time. So as I can't do that, I'm going to try out squash. What about you? I'm going to do the same as last year. Volleyball. That's good. It's in the main sports hall like the squash. I'll be able to see you a lot this year. Yeah, it looks like that. You can help me with the maths that I don't understand. Ha! <laughs> Maybe. For a small fee, of course. You now have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 26 to 30. I know it's early, but do you know anything about the first assignment that we have to do? Yes, it's already up on the Economics Faculty Notice Board. There's a choice of essays up there. I think there are about 10 you can choose from. I can't remember any of the titles though, apart from the one that I think I'm going to write about. What's that one then? It's about the short-term future of third world economies. Ooh, I don't like the sound of that. It seems very wide-ranging. It is, but remember that I spent some of the summer vacation travelling in Africa and Asia, so that has made me more interested in the subject, and I've also got some first-hand ideas on the subject. Does the essay list mention how long the essays have to be, and the deadlines? Yes. You remember last year, all the essays had to be 3,000 words in length. Well, that's gone up by 1,000 words. Oh no, they'll take ages. I know. I was hoping that they'd stay at 3,000 words, or only go up to 3,500. But no luck, I'm afraid. What about the deadline? The first one has to be in by the 30th of October, and the second one by the 30th of November. It looks like one essay a month, like last year. Well, at least that hasn't changed. But as it's the end of September now, that leaves only a month to get the first one done. I'm going to have to get on to that straight away. Yes, you'd better. If you want to talk about it, I'm going to be at the campus cafeteria at 1.30 for lunch. We could go over some questions. I can't then, as I'll be in the sports hall working out. How about three this afternoon at the economics common room? That seems OK. We'll be right by the economics course office where the questions are. So that'll be convenient for checking up on them. OK. See you then. Bye. Bye. That is the end of section three. You'll now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. 
you will hear part of an environmental sciences lecture. First you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning everyone. My name is Professor Wilson and I'm lecturing you today as part of your environmental sciences course. Part of this course is concerned with pollution issues in our world today and part of this lecture will look at some of the ways that the oil industry has developed to deal with oil spills around the world. Oil tankers are the largest ships to sail in the ocean. For countries such as Japan that have no oil deposits of their own, tankers are the only way that oil needed to power their economies can be moved. They are designed to hold millions of barrels of crude or refined oil in reasonable safety and without damage to the environment. When oil is released from these ships, the oil spreads out over the surface of the water in a large slick. These oil slicks can cover hundreds of miles and they cause huge environmental damage. Oil is released for varying reasons. Accidents while loading and unloading and deliberate spills account for many slicks today, but it is ships hitting other ships or rocks which is the major cause of slicks. Because oil slicks are so damaging to the environment, numerous ways of containing them and cleaning them up have been developed. In previous years, slick cleaners would sometimes try to set fire to the slicks and burn them off, but that is rarely done nowadays because, surprisingly, nearly all oil slicks consist of compounds that aren't flammable. Combustibility comes after refining. The four ways of cleaning up oil spills that we look at today are as follows. The containment boom, chemical detergents, the sponge, bacteria. The containment boom is the most common method of cleaning up after an oil spill. Barriers are erected in the water and the oil is then sucked up. Basically a containment boom is just a large float that surrounds and contains the slick. This method is cheap and straightforward, however only functions in very calm seas. Another method to clean slicks is to spray detergent solution from airplanes or boats directly onto the spill. Depending on the detergent, two things can happen. One possible result is that the oil can break up into clumps, which sink to the bottom of the ocean. Although these clumps are themselves hazardous, the problems caused by the clumps are much easier to deal with than the problems caused by oil slicks. The other possibility is that the oil then breaks down into tiny droplets, which are soon spread and become harmless. This method is well suited to dealing with the larger slicks. A negative aspect is that often the chemicals remain in the water, and they can kill fish and other marine life. A Berlin-based company has developed an alternative method for cleaning up oil spills. EcoCarbon has invented a giant sponge made of lignite resin that sucks up the oil, preventing it from harming the environment. The sponge comes as a mat, which contains crushed coal, whose small granules can soak up large amounts of oil. The process is safe and cheap. The sponges have so far withstood small-scale testing in pools of water with miniature oil slicks. A unique advantage is that once the oil is absorbed into the mat, it remains fixed there permanently. The downside, however, is that the mats become toxic waste. Scientists are also trying to improve other methods to fight oil spills. At the scenes of oil spills around the world, they found bacteria that seem to have an appetite for the toxic black sludge. Now the scientists are breeding these bacteria and studying them to determine which is the most effective at reducing oil levels. Eventually they hope to put the best bacteria to work in helping clean up after oil spill disasters. The bacteria actually use the oil as food. As the bacteria reproduce, they eat more and more of the slick until it finally vanishes. Eventually this method should be cheap, easy to administer and be completely eco-friendly, as when the slick is gone, the bacteria's food source is gone and they die, leaving nothing behind at all. So far, this method has no discernible drawbacks. Well, that's the end of the section of the lecture on cleaning up spills. This subject is an optional essay for your course. You'll find the reading lists and essay questions on the faculty notice boards along with a deadline for submission. If you choose it, seminars will be held at a later date.
That is the end of section 4. You'll now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of listening test 1. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.